Uh, this is Kyle McDonald. Um, Kyle is uh, an internationally renowned new media artist. He's been active since the mid aughts or so, give or take. Um, I've known Kyle since about 2008, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Kyle has a really wide spanning career that uh, in media arts, ranging from installation and performance with a wide range of collaborators, um, net artworks and so on. Uh, his work uses uh, code and machine learning, artificial intelligence, computer vision, uh, and other kinds of techniques to create interesting interactions that um, allow us to consider ourselves and our relationships in new ways. Um, Kyle is literally jet lagged from coming back from Japan from like from a uh, month long stint there to develop a brand new project that we'll probably see a bit of. I think without further ado, yeah, I'll just hand it off to you, Kyle. Thank you, Golan. Uh, I just wanted to start with a quick question. Um, could everyone close their eyes for a second? Close your eyes, close your eyes. Okay, if you would like me to keep my mask on, please raise your hand. Okay, C put your hands back down. Okay, open your eyes. Thanks, I'm gonna keep my mask on. Um, so, this is me. My name is Colin McDonald. I'm an artist based in Los Angeles and I'm experimenting. <laughs> <laughs> Let me swap those around one second. This is the wrong screen. How, wow, why didn't it go on the right screen? There's a button, right? I can never remember where the button is. Top right. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. So <laughs> that's me. My name's Kyle McDonald. I'm an artist visiting from Los Angeles near Bologna Creek on Tongva land. Uh, I came to the arts through music and code, and I've spent a lot of time working with new technologies like machine learning, computer vision, um, and wanted to say thanks to Nika and to Golan for having me here, and also to Claire for the incredible talk the other day. Um, like Golan said, this will My be name is Kyle. <laughs> kind, of in, kind of in two parts. Uh, so the first part will be public. I'm just going to kind of blow through it. No questions. Um, we can talk more about it after. Second part will be more interactive. I'm going to share some stuff that's more private. Um, I want to talk with you and hear what you're thinking. And then we'll do some kind of reviews at the end. Like Golan said, my work spans from pretty large scale installations um, to very per personal performances, conceptual work. Um, sometimes it's really even when it's like very aesthetic, uh, there's some kind of deep conceptual or geometric or computational thinking behind it. This was a project with Jonas Yongyan where we projected onto 50 disco balls and we map every single reflection of light. And this allows us to control the space like a big LED display. And so the calibration process is really complex, but when everything's finished, it feels like this magical coincidence and the technology is kind of hidden. This is what I was doing about 10 years ago. And uh, that was then, this is now. Uh, <laughs> um, so I wanna talk a little bit more. My kind of orientation of my work's changed a little bit in the last maybe four or five years. Um, this project uh, I wanna share with you is about uh, humpback whales. Um, I want to share a short story. So back in the 1960s, commercial whaling was pushing a lot of species towards extinction. That's you know where these big ships went out, killed whales, uh, and then brought the meat and blubber uh, back as products for you know uh, lamps and human consumption. Um, only about seven percent of humpback whales were left compared to their pre-whaling numbers. Um, around 1900, but then something kind of incredible happened. There was this US Navy engineer in Bermuda named Frank Watlington, and he'd been assigned to making underwater recordings of dynamite explosions. Um, and as he was working, sometimes he noticed these really haunting songs in the background of the tapes. So he spent years making recordings in secret, like on his off time. And in 1967, two friends came to visit uh, for some whale watching, and he played the tapes for them, and he said, you know, I think these might be humpback whales. Uh, this was a huge surprise because no one really knew that humpbacks could sing, except maybe some fishermen in different places around the Pacific. Uh, <laughs> so Frank's friends were Katie, uh, Katie Payne and Roger Payne, and they went on to press these songs to vinyl as what's now the best-selling album, uh, Songs of the Humpback Whale. <laughs> And their goal was to kind of weave humpback songs into human culture, and by doing so, reorient our relationship with these creatures. And it was massively successful. Uh, it was kind of the beginning of the modern environmental movement in a lot of ways. 
Uh, and today, humpback populations are back to about 90% of what they were pre-whaling. I still identify this as like one of the kind of most effective cultural interventions of all time. Other species haven't been quite as successful at recovering as humpbacks, so there are only around 300 North Atlantic right whales that are left. Um, they kind of come up and down like New England. Uh, and one of the main dangers these creatures are facing is marine debris. So there's this leftover fishing gear that kind of floats around and gets caught on whales, um, and it'll cut through their skin and slowly dig into their bones and kill them. So to draw attention to this, I've been working with this composer, Annie Lewandowski, um, from Ithaca to create these large installations out of recovered fishing gear. And we work with the Center for Coastal Studies uh, to remove fishing gear from the ocean. And then we work with scenic designer Amy Rubin to hang it up. And we fill the space with these humpback songs that Annie recorded with Katie Payne, who worked on that initial um, uh, album. So I've the part that I've contributed here is um, I've created the lighting design that uses this machine learning technique that kind of draws your eyes and ears in uh, to these complex patterns of the humpback whale songs, which can be kind of hard to pick up on a first listen. So it's a kind of visual annotation of uh, this complex acoustic phenomena. And I think there's a lot of space for artists and other creative people to work with this kind of new tech in a way that reorients and reconnects us um, with our environment. And I want to explore that space. Um, let's see, I have a think short video here. whales are fascinating. The songs that they sing are basically like uh, hit songs. So <laughs> every year in the Pacific, they all go to the North Atlantic around Alaska, and they sort of do jazz with each other. They kind of improvise and come up with something that they like, and they all settle on one song, and they all sing that the rest of the year. So there's uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of humpbacks that basically are involved in like um, one of the largest kind of cultural co-creation um, events on earth uh, every year, and they never repeat the same song from year to year. Uh, they've been doing this probably for a few million years. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to know when they started. We just have got their bones, and we know that they've existed in their current form for a few million years, so they pro we can guess they've probably been singing about that long. Um, maybe they have repeated something over that time. <laughs> um, oh, I wanted to just show this, because kind of in the corner of the installation, we have this little uh, monitor that's sort of behind the scenes view. It's showing a diagram of kind of where the lighting design comes from and um, helping people to understand the sort of uh, recursive complexity of the um, humpback whale song. It has kind of like classical music structure where there's sequences of phrases that get repeated and are organized into themes which are organized into larger structures. Um, so that lighting design comes from this technique I've been exploring for probably about seven, six, seven or eight years, um, called uh, nonlinear dimensionality reduction. A little bit of a mouthful, but you've also maybe heard of UMAP or TSNI. And the idea with that is to basically take a big data set and organize it in space so that things that are similar end up close to each other and things that are different end up far apart. So this is a bunch of handwritten digits. If we zoom in, we can kind of see uh, the similar looking digits are close to each other. And if we zoom out, we can also see, you know, there's 10 digits that we write um, and they kind of cluster automatically. We could also use tiny images of ancient Japanese characters and those will end up close together with each character type clustered into their own region or tiny images of fashion items and all the high heels form a cluster to the bottom right and the boots are at the top left. So these, Techniques like UMAP and TSNI, they can suggest a shape to a data set that's sometimes hard to see just from looking at an individual data point. Um, and I first explored this technique in the context of drum samples. Welcome. Oh. Oh. 
Hello. 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 I was thinking about new ways we can explore large sound data sets for composition and improvisation. And this kind of approach of uh, dimensionality reduction, it doesn't give you a single definitive answer. So there's lots of uh, different ways to organize a data set. It's more of a starting point for other kinds of exploratory analysis. Um, I showed this to a friend, uh, Alexander Chen, who just moved to rural Massachusetts, and he said, oh, I've been obsessed with bird calls. Can we do bird calls? So we did that. This is using data from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And then you can also snap these spectrograms to a grid to kind of navigate them more easily. And after working with Alex on those bird calls, he got in touch to ask what we could do with underwater recordings. He had he connected me with these researchers at uh, National Oceana Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, to hand over this seven terabyte data set from these devices called HARPS. These are high frequency acoustic recording packages, which means that they record up to about 100,000, or sorry, 100 kilohertz, uh, and they get down sampled to like 16 kilohertz for analysis. Um, but they're deployed at depths of around 400 to 900 meters, and they sit there for months at a time, just kind of recording uh, data. And they'll save power by alternating between recording and sleeping. So it might be 75 seconds of recording and then sleeping for 15 minutes. Uh, so the data was recorded over like a 12-year period, and if you put all the recordings back to back, it would take about 15 years to listen to all of it, um, which seemed like the perfect place to you know, throw in some of these exploratory listening um, algorithms. Um, Katie Payne was also one of the first people to pioneer uh, spectrograms for understanding uh, humpback songs and kind of for um, animal communication in general. And uh, 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 I'm going to keep going. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, this is like a year of audio. You can't even make sense of it at that scale. What we were trying to do, so Alex was working at, uh, is work, was working at Google Creative Lab, um, and he had the idea to basically make like a explorer for a year of humpback whale songs called Pattern Radio. Um, so that's what we built together. Um, we made a site that basically identifies which sounds are similar and kind of highlights them as you're listening so that you can see some visual indicator of that sort of recursive, recurrent structure of the humpback songs that I was talking about. And then I met Annie as I was working on that pattern radio project, um, and that's what led us into working on this Siren installation together. We really, for that Siren project, wanted to explore some more of these like experimental techniques that can't quite make it into like a big Google-funded project. <laughs> uh, like how do we map these sounds to colors, for example, in a way that makes some kind of um, synesthetic sense Let's see. So this is like one way I think about these sounds. On the top, we've got this playback happening of a humpback song that's going kind of A, B, A, B, and then B. So you can think of like a single repeating loop as a loop in space, like it's following a circle. And sometimes it diverges a little bit. That's that diagram at the top left. Like the sound's a little different. Oh, and I don't, I don't have the audio for the bottom one, sorry. Um, but the bottom one, you can see, it's got two kind of parts. There's A, A, B, 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 A, A. So there's two loops, and we're kind of jumping between them. Um, this is like the core idea behind what we were doing for Siren was basically using dimensionality reduction to, uh, over time to take slices of audio, lay it out in a way that automatically identified paths through the kind of structural space of the sound, and then 
use those paths as uh, color embeddings. Sorry, is that a lot? <laughs> um, you know, if you're in, like an expert bioacoustics researcher, you're going to create these transition diagrams. Um, and if you're, you know, in CS or math, you might have seen something like this for other purposes before. Uh, and these are corresponding to humpback whale songs. This is a pretty good description of like what a humpback whale song is. Um, you know, if you were to annotate a humpback whale song, it wouldn't be written down like the way that you'd write classical music. Uh, because it actually has a bit of a probabilistic quality to it. It's not rigid. Sometimes they jump from one thing to another, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes that probability is high, sometimes it's low. Um, but for this, it's like designed to answer a question or make a judgment or make a comparison between uh, two songs. And I'm more trying to craft like an evocative gesture that pairs well with listening and exploration instead of like deciding something, um, trying to help people develop sort of intuitive appreciation rather than more academic understanding. So uh, let's see, let's keep going. So this might be like what those individual songs from the Humpback look like. And there are comparisons we can do when we use this technique, even though that's not what I was do, you know, going in this direction for. Uh, you can look at like three humpbacks singing the same song and kind of take the sort of scatter plot, the UMAP not, you know, dimensionality reduction diagram of their song and see, oh, there's some overlap between the three. You know, if we put them on top of each other, some of the sounds, the units are performed very similarly by different singers and others really have a lot of diversity like this at the bottom left this low f uh, uh this kind of one cluster that's like red green blue um that's the called the f unit uh and it's this really low growl oh, and it inhabits kind of different acoustic space for the singer in green compared to the ones in red and blue which are more overlapping so that led to the final lighting design for siren um to recap, we start with these spectrograms, uh, and then we used UMAP to map these into two-dimensional gestures, and then those were mapped from these 2D gestures to a 2D color space, and then these colors were used to kind of light up the installation. Hopefully, when you're watching it, what you see is like, oh, you know, that blue sound, I just heard that a second ago. Um, that is a repetition of something. Oh, it's blue-green, blue-green, blue-green. Uh, that makes sense because I'm hearing a kind of A-B structure right now. Um, and that is kind of happening for about 30-minute performance. This is what the little um, debug visualization looks like that I showed earlier. Oh, that was that F sound. <laughs> So again, my hope with these visualizations is not like, I'm going to make some really beautiful pictures or great lighting design, um, or we're going to figure out something about humpbacks that uh, helps us like write a paper. Um, you know, I'm not interested in like creating or sharing more information. I'm, I'm more interested in this like intuitive connection that we can have with our environment and our relatives. Um, I'm really interested in exploring that in concert with machine learning, with this kind of hybrid intelligence that allows us to listen more deeply. And I think there's a lot of space for um, this kind of work with new tools. Like I was saying, there's, you know, there are so many misapplications of computer vision uh, and domain of surveillance uh, around humans. Um, and I think it can, you know, just also easily, computer vision can be easily misused in a variety of domains. But when you look at the natural world, there's a lot of space to explore and understand and reconnect that I think uh, gets overlooked. There's some papers I was looking at recently where, you know, they're trying to track and understand different ecosystems in a more automated way. Um, you know, best case scenario is we just get a lot of people outside and spend time 
looking like with our eyes. Uh, but we can't always do that. And we also learn different things when we have a computer look for us and then look at the kind of extracted data. So I don't think we should overlook that. We should try and work in concert with that. Um, here's a picture of a guy in LA collecting a bunch of bird scooters. <laughs> this is my neighborhood. This is where I live. All right, I want to talk about a different project uh, on learning language. <laughs> um, this is from Lauren McCarthy, uh, one of my longtime collaborators, uh, and myself. And we just uh, put this together at Yamaguchi Center for Arts and Media in collaboration with them. Um, and that's where I'm coming back from right now. Uh, I haven't spoken about this project before, so I'm just going to kind of wing it. And we'll see how it goes. Um, we started this project with the idea that uh, we spend a lot of time um, kind of modifying ourselves for machines to understand us better. You know, we use a specific accent when we're talking to our phone because it doesn't understand our own accent. Uh, we kind of point our face at just the right way when we're swiping up to unlock our phone just so that it can see our face correctly. Uh, we walk in a certain way or, you know, there's <laughs> all sorts of things we do to kind of contort ourselves for the machines. And we wanted to see what would happen if uh, the machines kind of looked back at us and said, we miss the old you. We miss when we didn't understand you. <laughs> can we uh, go back to that time? We want to help you get back there. So this um, piece is a little bit of uh, one of the only narrative works that Lauren and I have worked on together. It's basically a set of future AIs got together, and they decided that they miss when humans were more human, and they wanted to help us become more human again. So in this space, we've got a bunch of different sensors and actuators, and we try and kind of like track everything that everyone is doing and give them lots of feedback about whether they're being understood or not whether they're being detected or not. We've got four cameras and four microphones. It seats up to eight people. Do you know what a butt kicker is? Anybody? Butt kicker is like a bass shaker. So if you ever go to the theater and you feel like your seat vibrate, like at the movie theater, it's because they've got this thing under the seat that's literally shaking it. You can buy those. They're great. And they're used sometimes by people who are like really into violent video games. <laughs> but they're also used for, um, uh, you know, making movies more immersive or um, making interactive installations. <laughs> uh, they're great. And we've got those under the seats. We've got a bunch of lights that are programmable. And we're trying to use this all together to basically like watch what everyone's doing and guide them through about a 30-minute conversation. Um, this is what the space looks like. The conversation is kind of like, um, you get introduced to the AI, uh, and it tells you, you know, we want to help you figure out how to be more human again. Asks you to kind of <laughs> go through some different exercises, and by the end, everybody looks like this. They're kind of like rolling over the chairs and attempting to communicate with each other in ways that cannot be detected by the pose detection algorithm or with speech that cannot be detected by the speech recognition system. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a little journey everybody goes through together. Um, for me, one of the most interesting things about this project was that we paired it with this opening performance. So in the same space, um, before the installation opened, um, we had a one-day, like one-time performance for half an hour with four actors who are also sort of acting as uh, dancers as well, um, where they basically uh, introduced us to the space and told us the backstory. Moshi, moshi. So they're the four AIs, uh, or the four actors are AIs in this piece, and they kind of tell us about how, uh, like I said, they sort of love what humans used to be, and they wish we could get back to that. Um, and they guide the audience through some different exercises. Uh, that's a kind of preview of what's going to happen in the installation, and um, do a lot of reflecting on what it means to be human. Um, this piece was really fascinating to work on because we developed it simultaneously in Japanese and English, and neither Lauren nor I sp really speak Japanese. Um, so we worked with YCAM uh, to figure out like what does AI mean in Japan compared to what does it mean in Anglophone cultures? What does technology mean? How does hope and uh, criticism work differently? What do people expect uh, from an AI 
in different cultures. And um, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is really fresh. <laughs> so there's still a lot I'm thinking about with this project, but I'd be happy to talk more about it later if you've got other questions. Okay, um, this is a meme I made the other day that I thought was funny. <laughs> Uh, here's another project I worked on with YCAM called Sakoku Explorer. Uh, I, you, I don't think you know this one, Golan, actually, but um, I just wanted to mention this really briefly because I thought it was very relevant to this class. Um, this is connected to the Unlearning Language project in that it's part of a bigger initiative YCAM has been working on for about three years that's around um, kind of our data and surveillance and machine learning. Um, we ran a workshop called Am I Nothing But Net, where we asked everybody who participated to run all of the data exporters for their different um, accounts, you know, get all their Google data, all their Twitter data, all their Facebook data, anything they've got, download it using, you know, the GDPR export tools. And then we load it into this tool, which you can check out if you want. It's uh, right here, uh, Sakoku Explorer. Sakoku refers to this period in Japanese history where the country was uh, closed, mostly closed to outsiders um, for about 100 years. And uh, we were thinking about like where that lives today in terms of the kind of more negative end of like protectionism versus like the more positive end of sort of intentional community-led control over what gets in and out of a culture. Um, and basically when you drop all your data in here, it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, the website, like, <laughs> it's way too much data. We wouldn't want to take it from you anyway, but um, it stays in your browser. Uh, and then it will basically visualize it on a calendar like this. <laughs> this is my data, by the way. Um, so <laughs> you can see I use my computer a lot. <laughs> Um, I think a lot of those are like Google searches, um, and there's Facebook discussions, there's me watching YouTube videos, ads that were served to me, um, you know, direct messages, image searches, and if you click on any of these uh, calendar events, then it'll pop up the kind of correlated uh, media for you. Um, yeah, this was a really fun workshop to lead because it, everyone got a really direct bit of insight into like what kind of data is actually tracked on you. Uh, we have this feeling all the time that like everything's being taken, everything's being tracked, but it's hard to put like a number and visualize it. And uh, I think seeing it in this calendar view gave us um, a lot more opportunity to like discuss it more clearly. We also ran some games with it where it was like uh, <laughs> who has the most data tracked on them. <laughs> and uh, you know, if someone here was most likely to be identified as like a terrorist who would have the keywords that match that the best <laughs> and <laughs> a lot of other like really uncomfortable things that um, uh, brought us like to some better discussion. Again, this was like a bilingual project. We did it in Japanese and in English, um, which is a can be a pain for this kind of reactive web design, but um, I think it made the project a lot better in the end because it made the discussion a lot more um, nuanced and uh, yeah, this is another meme I made recently. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like, I don't know how many people actually get this one, but uh, we'll talk later. <laughs> okay, uh, I wanna talk about faces for a little bit. So, um, you know, you saw I've done some stuff with computer vision, different stuff with machine learning, kind of like uh, in a like complicated dance with surveillance culture. So. Um, my work with face analysis specifically tar started in 2009. Um, I met artist Theo Watson through an open source toolkit called Open Frameworks. Has anyone used Open Frameworks before? A couple people. Um, which was originally created by Zach Lieberman, and later Theo and Arturo Castro joined the core team. And for this project, we basically would, we ran a photo booth. You could walk up next to it, it would take a picture of you, and then it would kind of lay you out in a triptych with some other people who'd been through the photo booth before. Um, it would try and find some similarities and differences and sometimes put you next to other similar photos and sometimes put you next to other dissimilar photos. 
And we were doing a really kind of manual process for this at the time. Computer vision for face analysis in 2009 was not great. Um, we had to do a lot of like, okay, we know the face is approximately here. Um, if I rotate the image this much, face isn't detected. If I rotate it that much, it's not detected. So the orientation of the face must be somewhere in the middle. <laughs> like really manual stuff. Um, this is approximately the center of the face. So if we go up about 80% of the face height, then we can get something that's around the hair and identify the hair color. Like really manual. Um, but I had a lot of fun and it like, <laughs> I think everyone who came through the installation, um, you know, I, yeah. Sorry, I lost my breath a little bit. I'm like excited to share all this, and I also feel like two hours is not enough, <laughs> and I want and I want to give you a break breaks in the middle too. So, um, uh, okay, yeah. I guess the thing I wanted to say is, um, I think with this project, I realized the importance of uh, consent in some ways. Like this is an installation that you can either walk up to and have your fa photo taken or not, and just see other people's photos that were taken. Um, and you get to see what's gonna happen with your face before anything happens. Um, that made it all feel really good and playful, and it didn't feel like anything weird was happening. At the time, there was no GDPR, and uh, there weren't any requirements around like deleting people's faces. I think that's the main thing that would be different if we showed this today. It would basically be that you know after 30 days, we'd make sure all the faces were wiped. Um, Okay, and then to explain like where phases went next, <laughs> I need to mention another project. Um, around the same time, 2009, I was trying to, <laughs> I, I was thinking about, I was just starting to think about surveillance. I was thinking about if it would be possible to kind of unseat some of the power of surveillance by kind of surveilling myself. Um, so I ran this project for a year where every single character I typed on my computer was automatically posted to Twitter, <laughs> every 140 characters. Um, and that was difficult. Uh, I, I learned a lot about like what privacy meant to me. And I realized that a lot of the things that I said with my computer weren't just mine. They were discussions with other people who had some of their own say in whether what I was saying should be public or not. Um, I also realized over that period of time that when I knew that everything I was doing was being watched, it really changed my feeling about what I was doing in a way that had probably happened a long time ago when it comes to other kinds of surveillance, but I just never really noticed. Um, I, doing this again to myself, kind of forcing myself to be a su subject of surveillance um, is also something that like for me as like, at the time, younger, but white man, like it's not something that I've been like regularly aware of throughout my life. I'm the one in the kind of social position of power who doesn't have to worry about like, you know, whether men or other men are staring at me most of the time or worry about whether I'm safe or worry about whether I look like an outsider. Um, in the US, it's not my issue. Um, and this gave me a chance to basically feel a little bit of like, oh, <laughs> if everything I'm doing is seen and uh, processed or has the potential for that from everybody else, that sort of changes how I feel about being in the world a little bit. Um, not saying that's a, it, you know, created any kind of equivalence, just uh, it gave me a hint of something that I hadn't experienced before. Um, and I learned a lot from that. Um, and I tried to figure out if there was some way to um, extend that to something more visual instead of just like this text-based medium like Twitter. So I did an experiment for a couple days where I just recorded a photo of myself from my laptop every minute. Um, I call this auto time-lapse. Uh, and yeah, this sort of went in another interesting direction that eventually got the Secret Service to raid my house, but that's a project for another time. <laughs> um, the other thing I was doing in that moment was I was experimenting a lot with um, kind of modifications you can make to faces. Uh, so I, I helped create this idea of like face swapping um, that became popular in kind of the mid 2000s. In 2011, I um, created this with Arturo Castro, one of the Open Frameworks developers I mentioned earlier. We called it face substitution, um, but 
I think later when it got added to Snapchat and some other apps, then the name changed. I just wanted to show this is one of my favorite face swaps of all time. <laughs> um, so some of my work creates like this, these fleeting connections between people. Um, and sharing faces is this co-located installation I did which matches the expressions of visitors from one place to those of another. Uh, this idea came to me um, probably in the mid 2000s, uh, but it didn't really, it wasn't really obvious like where it needed to happen until I had a trip from Korea to, sorry, from Japan to Korea. Um, and I was talking with friends in both places about like, you know, for me as an outsider, trying to understand the similarities and differences between the different cultures. And, um, you know, uh, as like, uh, yeah, especially very naive outsider, it was like, this is strange feeling like to see people who to me um, appear similar, but have very different cultural practices. And uh, actually there's a lot of uh, historical tension between the two countries because of like war crimes and other kind of difficult relationships over time. And um, as we were talking more, we were thinking like, yeah, is it possible to kind of break down some of the connection between identity and our face in the similar way to like with portrait machine, when you go through that installation and you see yourself next to other people, you start to think about yourself in all the ways that you're similar to other people instead of just feeling like, oh, I'm a different person, no one's like me. You see all these similarities and um, things that match. Um, and yeah, and so we basically thought it would be fun to make an installation where when you walked up to it, you would only see photos of people from the other place. So if you're in Korea, you'd see photos of people from Japan. If you're in Japan, you'd see photos of people from Korea. Uh, and you wouldn't know until you read the wall text what was going on. Um, and it was interesting to see people's reaction. Like they would have a fun time being like, oh, this is mirroring my face. I get to have this feeling of like, these must be my neighbors. And then read the text and be like, huh, that's not who I was expecting my neighbors to be. Um, yeah, I'm, I still, this is a complex project for me because I think at the time, um, like I said, there was, I had a lot more naivety around like, I wasn't really thinking about my own position of privilege and being able to like uh, separate my own identity from the way I looked. Like I wasn't thinking about whiteness and I wasn't thinking that like I get to have the default identity. Um, and when we came up with this project together, um, yeah, it seemed really obvious to me, like, oh, this is a really interesting thing to do. This is connected to my experience of being like a naive outsider. Um, but now, I don't know, I don't know. I'm, I'm still thinking about this one. It's fun, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that. It's fun to go up there and see what it feels like to see your face reflected in other people that you may or may not identify as your neighbors or friends. Let's skip that one. Oh, you want, don't want me to skip that one? Okay. <laughs> Um, some more face thoughts. So with blind self-portrait, a uh, visitor sits in front of a camera, places their hand on a robotic platform, and we hand them a pen. And then when they close their eyes, the platform starts moving autonomously. Uh, it forces them to create a self-portrait. <laughs> so we basically treat their body as a sack of flesh, uh, as a tool for the machine. Um, and I don't know, I was fresh out of, uh, Still fresh out of college, I was thinking a lot about like Jean-Paul Sartre, and uh, he had this idea of like distinguishing unconscious being and conscious being, and he argued that we all feel this extreme angst and anxiety all the time because we have to consciously decide to do what to do. Like that's our problem as humans is that we have to decide what to do. We sort of wish we could just exist unconsciously with de without decisions like a rock or like a tree, uh, but instead we've got this angst in us. Um, and I think in some ways uh, <laughs> this piece creates that kind of like rock-like state uh, by handing our intentionality to this automated system. Um, so it's strange though, while your hand's being moved by the machine, it's so uncanny, it becomes really tempting to then kind of break free and be like, no, I want to move my hand again. <laughs> the moment that you get to be a rock or you get to be a tree, you somehow want to be a human again. Um, and 
I feel like this is one of the only really good projects I've made about artificial intelligence because it actually gives you a chance to feel some of the things that are so, sort of in your subconscious all the time about how we feel about technology. Uh, I, I would hope that a lot of the work that I make would just give people a chance to feel things that we don't normally let ourselves feel. I am gonna skip this one though. And maybe this one, uh, this is very relevant, but okay, I'm gonna keep going. Talking about faces. People talk about bias a lot with faces, but I think the thing to talk about is power and control. Uh, uh, oh, it's difficult. How much can we talk about here? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, maybe we will come back to these if it's relevant. I was going to talk about the way that mm, face analysis is used for control of different people. Yeah, okay, we're just going to keep going for now. Here's a diagram I made recently. I was trying to figure out when I say yes to a project and when I say no. Uh, and so I sort of start at the top, and you look at like whether this project is kind of creating any equity in the world. Um, if no, then you reject it. And if yes, you ask the next question. Uh, next question is, is this an existing responsibility that I have? <laughs> I should probably do that. Uh, next question is, if it's not an existing responsibility, well, is this a once in a decade opportunity? And basically, I just always say yes to those. Um, is it for a friend? And then yes, of course. Uh, is it three months out? If it's not three months out, I've started to say no recently because it's just hard to plan less than three months right now unless you know one of those previous conditions is true and then will it make a big difference like is this a way that I can help a lot um, that's an important question for me and fortunately I'm in the position where at this point I'm not getting paid a lot but I get to put does it pay well at the end and if it's not paying well then <laughs> you got to move on um, Okay, I wanna talk about fencing for a second. I got to help on a project at the Olympics last year, uh, or two years ago, how long ago was that? 2022, two years ago, who knows, time, what's time? Um, oh, I forgot to put this in the face section. Okay, I just wanna show you something funny for a sec. This is a game I made. Um, mm -mm -mm. I'm gonna pull this up. since we're talking about faces. Okay, face work. Congrats on becoming a face worker. Our AI finds the perfect face for every job. Audition for each job by showing us you can make your face fit what the job needs. Ready to try out for your, neck for your first job? All face analysis uh, happens on device, images are no images are uploaded. Okay, here we go. Get ready. Start with your first job. Food delivery, friendly, smiling. <laughs> hey. There you go. Hold on. All right. Friendly delivery. The smile was the perfect appetizer. I got paid a buck. Well, I got paid. I got paid two bucks, but you know, face work takes a fee, so, okay. Uh, all right, what do we got next? What should I do? I could be a portrait photographer. Oh, they need someone. I've gotta look like I've got soft lighting. Mouth wide open, dental training, okay. Yeah, there you go. Uh, all done, there we go. Uh. <laughs> Ah, uh, 97, nice, that was a good score. Perfect for our students. They held their mouth open for hours without complaint. Plus, it turns out they had some interesting tooth decay. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm up to $3.40. All right. Oh, something's happening. Hello, can you see this? No, wait, don't answer. So I'm not gonna give it away, but it gets really interesting <laughs> once you meet the hacker. Um, I, yeah, if you get a chance to play that, let me go know how it goes. I think it's a fun game. And uh, it sort of summarizes, like, in some ways, I don't know, six, eight years of face analysis research I've been doing. Uh, all right, continuing. Uh, oh, here's some of the, this was some of the behind the scenes while I was working on that. Okay, the reason I wanted to mention this one is because 
you've already seen a bunch of computer vision stuff that I've done in the past. Um, sometimes that's really kind of scary and creepy and connected to uh, problematic uh, applications of technology in society. And sometimes I end up just doing it uh, kind of as an engineer and technical consultant. And that was this project. Fencing. Okay, so does anybody know anything about fencing? <laughs> okay, two people, sort of. Yeah, super interesting sport. Um, it's been happening for a couple hundred years and much longer in other forms. Um, and uh, I didn't know anything about it, but uh, there was this Japanese fencer who wanted to track and kind of do augmented reality on top of Olympic fencing. Um, so they made this kind of demo video, I think this was like eight years ago, where they put little tracking balls on the, um, on the weapon. It, obviously, you cannot put tracking balls on Olympic level <laughs> weapons because uh, that completely changes the dynamic of the of the sport. Uh, so we went in there with a bunch of cameras instead and did a lot of computer vision and machine learning to basically train about 24 GPUs to look at 24 cameras at 60 frames per second and figure out in 3D where the weapons were at all times and then overlay data on top of that. Um, so I just wanted to show this because machine learning can also just be like a really practical engineering tool. Um, I worked with this, I worked on this with a Japanese studio called Rhizomatics. They were the one leading this project. This is what it kind of looked like behind the scenes when we were testing. We had like a little setup with uh, miniature fencers and the cameras were all really close to each other. Um, and a bunch of different computers that were doing video switching. You, you know, you only need to analyze a few of the cameras at one time because most of the, the fencing piece, like the sort of runway, is really long. Uh, so they're only in one area of the scene at a time, but you always want like a high resolution image. So you put cameras all along and then you use LiDAR to figure out which cameras you should be looking at at any given moment. So this was behind the scenes in the studio and then this was sort of what it looked like on the uh, Olympic stage. So we got to do like instant playbacks right after um, someone would score uh, a point, a touch, uh, then we would do kind of slow motion playbacks where you could really follow the weapons closely. In some ways this is like similar to the humpback work because the humpback project Siren is about kind of onboarding people faster into a complex nuanced thing that most people don't have any expertise on. Um, this is sort of trying to do the same thing. Um, here's a meme I made about uh, different USB-C connectors. I was trying to figure out, yeah, I think I got the Zoomer one right. It's definitely like a vape, right? USB-C vape. This is the most complicated one. It took me a long time. Okay. Okay, actually, I'm just going to go straight to discrete figures. Uh, and if we've got a little extra time, exhausting. A, uh, now, you know what I'll do is I'll just show exhausting a crowd on the screen for a second. We're going to go here. Exhausting a crowd. Uh, this project was based on a book by uh, experimental French writer Georges Perec, uh, who basically sat on a bench in Paris for three days and he wrote down every single detail he could about what he saw. He just kept writing, writing, writing as fast as he could. You know, a bus number 73 just drove by. Someone just dropped a piece of bread in the street. Pigeon picked it up. Uh, dog is barking at a small uh, cat. Uh, this woman walked by. Anyway, it just keeps going and going for like 80 pages of text. It's, it's incredible. I really recommend reading it. Um, and you feel like, okay, this is what it was like in the 60s in Paris. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, in some ways this bears like a strange similarity to the way that machines look at us. It's a kind of like, um, 
looking without story. It's like an information without knowledge or understanding kind of situation. Um, and I thought it would be fun to kind of recreate it with the kind of gaze of collective uh, looking into the scene instead of just one person sitting on a bench. So we recorded 12 hours of footage in London. Um, I also worked with uh, Jonas Yongyan on this. He did the, a lot of the development, the same friend who worked on uh, Light Leaks. And this is what we've got. You can kind of come to this site and uh, click on something that you think interesting is happening and uh, say what's going on. <laughs> Hello Art and Technology class. That's strangely timely. <laughs> Two human beings over here came from another dimension. People still have selfie sticks. Making a video for TikTok. Lads, lads, lads. Is this legal? It is. It is a good question. And it's also funny to see people leaving notes like, do you think anybody's watching us right now? <laughs> it's funny, there's also a lot of people who, so the camera changes angles a little bit, and when it turns a little bit to the right, um, there's a crosswalk, and every now and then you see a car run the red light, um, and people get really mad about it. And I think something about having this perspective on everything basically turns you instantly into a cop. Like, you want to police people when you look at them from this perspective. When you're looking down from this kind of position of authority, like, you instantly want to go into police mode. Yeah, that's, yes. <laughs> anyway, so we've, uh, I recommend checking it out. Uh, it's tied to your local time, usually. Uh, right now, we're in a little bit of a strange uh, zone. I think this is like the end of the piece, so it might be looping around, but Normally, if you go there you know, at 4 p.m., then you should see like 4 p.m. London time. Um, and then the other locations we've got here, we've done it in a few different places since then. And uh, these are just one hour loops, so sometimes they're a little bit more dense. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of different. We've got uh, three sites for each of the other locations. OK, uh, this is me trespassing on Mark Zuckerberg's Kauai property. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, discrete figures and uh, dance and bodies. Um, I started thinking about dance around 2008. I saw this piece, Body Traces, from Lisa Pata, a choreographer, and Sophie Kahn, an artist, um, where they were making 3D scans, uh, kind of like time-lapse 3D uh, dance films. Actually, let me just um, go to doing this again. Oh, stop me. Okay, uh, and here we go. This is how they're making it. Uh, they had this little Lego LiDAR device where, or not LiDAR, Lego laser line where it would slowly scan across the scene. Um, and she would, Lisa would lay there while it scanned her slowly. And I don't know if you can tell, but that's someone wearing all black so that they don't get picked up, providing support for her while she gets scanned. <laughs> um, the movie, like the final dance film, must have been hundreds of frames long, and it took about five minutes to scan her for each frame. It was absolutely tiring to imagine the amount of work that went into this short film. Uh, I saw that, and I thought, we got to be able to do better than this. <laughs> um, my inner goal on kicked in, I guess. This, yeah, this is way before the connect. So um, I basically figured out that if you project something with a projector onto someone, uh, it gets distorted, right? Like if you project a line onto someone and you look at it from a different perspective, it has a shape to it. If you project a bunch of lines, then they each have a, their own shape. And you can kind of follow that shape, figure out the 3D structure of someone's body uh, in real time. Uh, this is called Structured Light, and um, Claire was talking about it the other day. This is one version of it, and you can do it yourself. You don't need to buy some $20,000 device. Uh, this is tech that you can implement yourself with a projector and a camera. Um, that got me into some other kinds of tools. Like I worked, again, with YCAM in 
I think this was 2014 or something, on this project called Ramdance Toolkit. Ram is, Ram is a reactor for awareness and motion. The idea with this project was we wanted to, if you're working with contemporary dancers, you might discover very quickly uh, that they kind of hold uh, an imaginary space in their head that they maintain in order to coordinate together um, that has a bunch of rules and images of where each other are and what each other are doing. Um, and we basically wanted to like visualize that imagined space so that they could see it outside of themselves and the audience could see it outside themselves too um, and see what kind of work emerged when you could actually see that shared imaginary space. Um, why can't built a custom tracking system for this? Uh, again, this was like early 2010, so there wasn't some of the solutions we have now for camera-based tracking. We had to use these kind of accelerometer, G gyro, magnetometer sensors that were on the body. Uh, we weren't the first to do this, so you know, Oscar Schlemmer was doing Man with Slanting Bars in 1930, uh, Klaus Obermeier uh, and Daito Manabe, I worked with them before to deconstruct figures in different ways, and Klaus has been doing that for a long time before either of us. Um, Mark Coniglio is working with Isadora since 1989, or Calypso from, and uh, Icon from Frieder Weiss around 93, um, working with Chunky Move, I was really influenced by Open Ended Group, who was doing this kind of work in the late 90s. There's a huge history here. I could give a whole talk just on this stuff. Um, and Discrete Figures, this collaboration with uh, Rhizomatics and this dance group 11 play uh, in Tokyo, um, this started with an uh, idea from Daito uh, from Rhizomatics, an artist and musician and DJ. And uh, he thought, why don't we do a piece that's about kind of math in the body? Um, and we started talking about how different cultures, you know, sometimes don't just count to 10, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They'll count much higher using lots of different joints on their body. This is a recurring thing uh, around the world. This isn't like in just one location, but the specific example comes from Papua New Guinea. We were thinking about how computer vision algorithms kind of break down people's bodies mathematically in other ways. Um, you know, history of uh, Murray and the uh, chronophotograph, the Bond analysis, just different ways of understanding bodies that come from dance and science and different cultures. Uh, let's see. So we wanted to see, as part of this project where we were exploring this theme of mathematics in the body, we wanted to think about like what was happening right now, which was the way that machine learning understands bodies. Um, and we decided to collect this data set of uh, different dances and then train an algorithm to generate new dances from it. This was the data set collection process. <laughs> We did that for like a whole day with like five different dancers. It was kind of fun. Um, oh, there's so much data. Okay, uh, this is kind of what it looked like. Um, we were compressed, like we were looking into compressing neural nets, like neural nets that would basically take a pose and compress it into a small set of numbers and then try and re-expand it again, um, which would do funny things like this. Like it would basically take the pose on the left and turn it into the pose on the right, where it was sort of right, but not completely right. Like we thought that was an interesting lens, like the machine learning as dirty uh, film kind of <laughs> aesthetic. Um, and yeah, sometimes the math goes wrong and you gotta fix your quaternions. <laughs> um, let's see. Some people when they're doing this kind of work with uh, you know, 3D, uh, estimation from neural network, 3D body pose estimation from neural networks, they're really going for like accuracy, lifelikeness, for similitude. Um, like in video games, you really want a figure to like move very convincingly. Um, this is from a project called Phase Function Neural Networks for Character Control from University of Edinburgh. Um, you can basically put in, you know, data with a joystick and then 3D terrain and it automatically generates walk cycle phases and 
character motion. That's not what we were trying to do. We were trying to basically get the thing that was weirdly uncanny and reminiscent of human motion, but still had a very like mechanical uh, computational quality to it. Uh, and we got some stuff like this where it basically looks like we're looking into the soul of a person trapped inside a machine learning system. Um, the way that you, one way to do that is you basically like, instead of training your neural net to the end, kind of stop it as you, <laughs> as it's getting better. You just say like, okay, we're done now. <laughs> uh, we've got a neural network at home. Um, and <laughs> Uh, so you don't let it get to the plateau, and that's where you get to this kind of not quite human movement that we fell in love with. So during the performance, there's a lot of different scenes. It's about a uh, 40, 45 minute piece, um, but this dancer, Maru, who's a real human dancer from Eleven Play, she starts this scene by kind of exploring the space around this AR, AI dancer. There's a person with a camera on stage, and then this is what's projected on the screen behind them. Um, and uh, eventually, Maru tries to like imitate the dancer, which is one of my favorite moments in the piece, because the AI dancer is kind of doing this completely inhuman thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, slowly the generated motions interpolated with the cho actual choreography to create this kind of duet between the two. Um, and the AI dancer kind of slowly comes to life, like from being this silvery AI blob starts to get textured and look more like Maru. Um, and yeah, we were thinking a lot about the way that uh, creative expression is not something that just comes from within. It's something that happens between kind of creative individuals, um, whether that's two people or an AI and a, and a human. And yeah, finally at the end, it kind of transforms back into this silv silvery blob and tries to walk off the stage, but of course, it's stuck. It cannot leave the stage. Um, mm -mm. Oh, nine evenings. Okay, I'm just going to skip all this. Oh, we have some great debug scenes, though. <laughs> oh, we have a sequence also where we're like, we. Oh, I will mention this. We asked the audience to basically um, try to do their own dance before the piece uh, in front of this black screen. Um, so we show them like what one of the dances is and they try and copy it and then in the performance we basically regenerate them dancing it correctly like the way that the AI would so we get to see like the AI using their body um, to <laughs> try and yeah you can sort of see two different versions of what this looks like there's the pose matching version on the right and then there's the kind of GAN version on the left. Um, again, this was like three, four years ago. Image synthesis works completely differently now. Um, yeah, I, I could talk for like an hour about these two minutes, which are just two minutes of like a 45 minute performance. Um, but I just want to finish by saying we're, you know, still looking into new possibilities for different kinds of dance synthesis and classification and I'm really excited to explore these algorithms in contexts that they're not really designed for. Um, and to remember and like learn more the way that this alien perspective works, um, even though these, uh, these algorithms can never really understand what it means to be embodied. Uh, oh God, I was gonna have some final note about how this is all embedded, embedded in the surveillance uh, carceral complex, but let's take a 10 minute break. Thank you. <laughs>